Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's good to have you join us today. Our call to worship is focusing on God's relentless grace. Dear God, giver of all good things, let your grace flow through us a generous stream. Unstoppable, refreshing, abundant, we release these gifts into your river of love, flowing out to all the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sing with us, the river is here.
Good morning. It's so good to be with you all this morning. If not in body, definitely in spirit. How blessed we are. In God's word, it tells us that as we call upon his name, he will hear us and he will answer us. And I think this morning, that beautiful old chorus, it says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. A big thank you to all those who have helped to have us connected in this way. Pray today for each family represented in this Paradise Community Church. For those who are not well, cover them with your love. For those that are fit and healthy, we pray a blessing for you also. As Pastor Naira shared the story of Jonah with us, we will continue to look up and keep our eyes upon Jesus. We commit the leaders of the nation to you, Lord, especially Scott Morrison. Continue to strengthen him and give him wisdom as he leads us in the decisions to be made. As he looks to you, Lord, I know that you'll guide him. Give him a strong body and mind and keep his heart guarded against any negativity. For our premiers also, Lord, they each, as they lead the states, be with them. As these decisions are made, I pray that people will be happy to live within the guidelines and not be silly and be disobedient. For our world leaders also, it is a very heavy burden to be bearing. A big thank you to all those who have been working on the front line. They work so tirelessly. For all those people who are on their own, Lord, they may feel lonely, but they never need to be alone. As they look to you, Lord, you can comfort them. We call upon you today, Lord, to heal our nation. Let it be raised up again to be known as the great south land of the Holy Spirit. As people flow back into the churches, I truly pray that they will be stronger than ever. The name of Jesus will be high and lifted up and we will see revival across our land. I pray that people won't have lost their enthusiasm to serve you, Lord, and a complacency won't have crept in. Your word says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. As your spirit continues to work in us and through us, we will see souls saved for your kingdom. We continue to pray for Pastor Noah and Gabby and little Daniel. Thank you, Noah, for the great work you are doing in keeping our messages up to us week by week. We have been thoroughly blessed. Be with Gabby as she supports Noah and together they nurture Daniel. Give them godly wisdom as they bring this little one up in the love and the ways of the Lord. With all that is going on around about us, Lord, help us to look ahead. Each day the sun still comes up and it goes down. The sky is still blue. The trees are still green. The sun is still shining and the water is still flowing. The birds are singing their melodious songs and the butterflies flutter around. Let us always have a deep appreciation for your creation that blesses us day by day. It also helps us to be able to stay positive, knowing that you have put all these things in place for us. In closing today, I pray that we'll remember our church family. Each day, maybe send a note or a message, make a phone call and just bless somebody. As you continue to build your church, Lord, we will glorify your precious name and keep our eyes firmly fixed upon you. Our hope is only in you, and we will know that perfect peace that passes all our understanding. And we thank you for all these things in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Jonah 3 Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh, and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. 
This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This morning I want to begin by asking this question, who has been your greatest influence? To me it is my mother. You might be thinking it is your parents like me, you might be thinking about a teacher in your childhood, you might be thinking it is your mentor or your spouse. Whoever that person might be, we are thinking of them because they have touched our hearts in a profound way. We remember them for their warmth and love. We remember them because they believe the best of us when we could not see it ourselves. But do you know what else we remember them for? It is their truth-telling. We appreciate them because they did not hold back from telling us the truth when we needed to hear it. They have said to us things like, I don't think the girl or boy that you are dating is good for you or don't drink that, don't eat that excessively, it is not good for you, or I've been on that path, I don't want you to go through what I went through. We remember them for their truth-telling, meddling, and guidance and wisdom that they offered to us. In the passage read to us this morning, we see God interferes with Nineveh out of compassion. As their ways were terrible and self-destructive, God sends Jonah to Nineveh and he delivers a short, simple message and he saves the whole city. Personally, it was not until recently I took a great interest in the book of Jonah. As a child, I have heard of the story many times and as I grew up, I did not really buy it. I thought, Jonah's story was for children and it was a folk tale or legend. I did not really think it had any historical value. The reason for that is it not only talks about a big fish that swallows up a grown up man, but also of a city that is changed by a few words of man. How can some words of one person change a city, I thought. Look at what we are given this morning. A, pro, a, a, a preacher goes to a big city and proclaims this message for three days. Forty more days and your city will be overthrown. It was a dry, disheartening and frankly very unattractive message, yet the text says that the king and nobles, the greatest to, to the least people from all social classes in the city, listened, and they changed. It says everyone in the city turned away from their evil ways and their violence. How is this possible? In my research, I read something interesting that helped me make sense of this. Historians say, before Jonah came to Nineveh, the city underwent some terrible things. During the time the Ninevites had just had a severe flood and famine, and the city had been hit by two plagues, plus the people in the city saw a total eclipse of the sun before the prophet's arrival. Also, tribes in the surrounding area were threatening Nineveh. The historians believe this phenomena and political instability prepared the Ninevites for the message of Jonah. Historians suggest 
that seeing these terrible and peculiar things happening in the city, the Ninevites were looking for an answer. They were trying to make a sense of a grave peril in which they were. Look at what verse 5 says. It says, when Jonah preached, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. What's astonishing is, in the Hebrew translation, we see Jonah uses only five words and they were enough to turn the city around. Now you might be thinking, I still don't buy it. How can some words change a city? It takes much more than words to change society, culture, and people. Well, there are more recent examples that show us that the proclaimed words change cities. Let me share one of them, which I got from Timothy Keller's old sermon on revival. In the early 1850s, people in England thought the church was no longer viable and relevant. In London, churches were dead and they were in a lot of trouble. And there was a large Baptist church called New Park Street Chapel that seated 1,500. And only 150 or so people gathered together and huddled in one corner every Sunday. One Sunday in 1855, they called a 19-year-old boy to preach at the church who had not even finished high school. Do you know who that person was? His name was Charles Spurgeon. When this young man got there, there were 100 people or less in the church. But one year later, there were 3,000 people and he baptized 300 converts. The church in the city grew and grew. They had to knock down the building, so while they were building a new building, they went into a place called the Surrey Music Hall that seated 10,000 people, and 10,000 people showed up. At one point, they went to a place called Crystal Palace where they seated 27,000 people, and sure enough, 27,000 people showed up. A few years later, in the year 1859, not only did Spurgeon have a thousand converts get baptized, but the revival broke out across the world. You have heard of people like Hudson Taylor and Dwight Moody. They all were converted that year. 1859. Through the proclaimed words of people, God showed up in power and God changed the cities and world. I like how Keller ends his sermon on revival, summarizing his research. These are not exact words that he used, but he said something like this. As the revival broke out in the West, there was a tremendous impact on society. People of different social classes around the world changed the community in all its dimensions. Christians built colleges, universities, orphanages, and hospitals. There was a tremendous change in the crime levels, tremendous changes in the relationships between management and labor, and there was a tremendous social healing within families. People of all social classes, having been one to Christ, began to bear fruits in the culture. Historians who look at this through the eyes of a kind of a scientific method call it the naturalistic spectacles, but they do not know what makes of this part of the history. You see, God shows up in power, and when He does, the community changes, families change, cities and society change. When God shows up, history is made and it changes. Now, if you are a believer, you might be wondering how can God show up when He is everywhere? 
you might be thinking, isn't God everywhere all the time? How does God appear when He is present everywhere? Well, just imagine we are at the church together and you're hearing me delivering a sermon in front. And as I speak of something that might not be of your interest, I ask, are you still with me? You'd say yes. Then I would think, okay, I am, I am still with them and they are still with me. But after service during morning tea, I come to you closer and say, hi, it's great to see you today. How was your week? And we have a chat. In this situation, I am with you and you are with me, but the level of a relation, the level of intimate knowledge and engagement is different. You have probably heard of this saying, in prayers of benediction, pastors often say this, the Lord blesses you, keeps you, and He makes His face shine upon you. When the Bible says God makes His face shine on you, this means there is a higher level of a relation or engagement between you and God. This means God shows up and you are in God's intended presence. This was what happened in Nineveh, London and some parts of the globe in 1859. God showed up in power. He made his face shine upon them, and the cities changed. Now last week, as I was reflecting this passage, my heart was filled with hope. I was greatly comforted by it. Do you know why? Our world, our city, our community and families need restoration and healing at the moment. I've got some statistics on the impact of coronavirus to share with you this morning. And they are not good. According to a study, nearly 30% of the Australians are estimated to be experiencing high levels of worry and anxiety during this pandemic. And domestic violence cases have increased by 30% during coronavirus. Data from Google shows a 75% increase in searches about family violence during the pandemic. Also, the experts predict that between 14 and 26% of Australian workers could be out of work due to coronavirus situation. On top of that, we keep hearing of trade threats and political tensions built between nations and of Racism escalated and riots happening in our society, don't we? It is gut-wrenching and overwhelming to hear things like this on news every day. But if you are a believer of the Bible, you see the Bible encourages us not to lose hope. It tells us God shows up and He makes His face shine upon cities and nations and the world. And in this time of crisis, what our hurting families, churches, and community need is God's presence. It is God's power and His blessing more than anything. Then can we make God's face turn to us? Can we make His presence happen? No, the Bible opposes that idea. It tells us God's presence cannot be manipulated or controlled. God sovereignly chooses where He shows His face. But there are some signs that hint God's presence and His power. The passage this morning gives us two of them. The two signs of God's presence are two groups of people. The first one is group who are given a second chance by God. The second sign is people who cover themselves with sackcloth and sit down in the dust. What do I mean by that? Firstly, let's talk about the second chance people. In any revival, in any electrifying appearing of God, in any divine restoration and reconciliation, there are people whose lives are turned around by God 
When Jonah was the first called by God, he ran away from God and he almost died. He was thrown into the sea, but God, by his grace, miraculously saved him and gave him a new life. In any revival, in any reformation, God works with and through those who have experienced the transforming grace of God and profess this. I am a sinner, but God and his love changed my life, and I want to live for him. Many people who are watching this right now would understand what I am saying. Think about all that you do, like your work, your parenting, your charity work, involvement in church or services that you do for others. For those who are given a new life by God, their activities are not a means of earning money or meeting their own needs. That is not why we serve, we give time, and we reach out. Our activities are our walk with God. We see our activities as God's calling. We see our activities as a love-based obedience to God. And God shows up through His people to change the community and the city. Now, look at this changed man, Jonah. He does these three things to change Nineveh with God. And let us see if we are doing these three things as well. Jonah obeyed the word of God. He went to Nineveh and he proclaimed God's message. First of all, Jonah obeyed. In other words, he worshipped. He had a fellowship with God. He read the scripture. He prayed, he listened, he loved, and he trusted God. He praised and sang love songs to God. He nurtured his intimate and personal relationship with God. Then secondly, Jonah went. It means his faith was not all internal, but it was expressed through actions as well. He wasn't just sitting, praying, and studying the Bible and said, it is intellectually and spiritually so satisfying. No, no, no. He was in the world. This might look different for us today under coronavirus restrictions, but faith always involves actions. Then lastly, he proclaimed he did not shy away from conversations with others about his faith. When there was an opportunity, he talked about the greatness and grace of God that turned his life around. He was not afraid of being called narrow-minded. He knew to whom he belonged. In our church, there are many people like Jonah. Even during pandemic, God makes his face shine on the community through many people in our church family. I sincerely believe that. I am going to share one story about that. But before I do, there is another thing that the text tells the second chance people. Now, if you are an enthusiast of evangelism or seeing people convert like me, the text gives us a pearl of wisdom. It is a word of encouragement. The text basically tells us not to be disheartened when we do not see people come to faith in our ministry. When you read from verse 5 to verse 10 in the passage, in the Hebrew translation, you see the author uses this particular word to call God, that is Elohim, meaning the strong one. In contrary, in other places in the book, the name Lord is used, which refers to Yahweh, Israel's covenant-keeping God. This means the text does not necessarily mean that the Ninevites circumcised themselves and converted to Judaism after they heard Jonah's message. We don't know Jonah's ministry led them into the covenant relationship with Yahweh. It says everyone in the city turned to God, which means they benefited from the riches of God's general grace, but it does not say they converted. 
This tells us this, whomever we get in contact with, we should hope they come into a personal relationship with Christ. We serve and share in hope they will, but we should not expect that everyone will. Even if they do not convert, it does not mean God failed us. This morning, if there is anyone out there discouraged and disheartened for not winning many souls for Jesus, I just wanted to gently share this with you. Do you remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? He said he scattered and planted a seed, and someone else watered it. But God makes it grow. Friends, keep scattering the seed and plant them. And do not judge the success of your work with Christ by what you see. Success does not depend on us. Keep scattering and planting. God knows your heart, and Christ himself is our reward. A few weeks ago, I was talking to a lady in our church family on the phone. I haven't seen her and her husband since the shutdown. We talked about life during the pandemic. She said they do not use the internet at home. So I asked her, what they are doing with worship service every Sunday. She said, someone in our church family makes a DVD with a video of our church service every week and he delivers it to them every week. When I heard that, my eyes got teary. When no one takes notice, this man is scattering seeds. He is planting them. Through him, God is making his face shine on others. And I know many of you who are watching this right now are scattering and planting the seeds without expecting to receive anything in return. Friends, thank you for your faithfulness. God knows your heart. Let us together continue to be God's people. Let us continue to worship and obey God and go and proclaim in Jesus' name that His face shines on the world. The second sign that hints God's powerful presence is people who cover themselves with a sackcloth and sit down in the dust. It says in verse 6, when Jonah's Warning reached the king of Nineveh. He rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes, covered himself with a sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. What does this mean? In the ancient Near East, people wore sackcloth to show an attitude of humility. Uh, this tells us God makes his face shine on those who humble themselves. G.K. Chesterton, a brilliant English writer in the 19th century, was once asked by London Times to write an essay. They wanted him to write on the problems of the world. What is wrong with the world? They asked G.K. Chesterton. And he wrote this essay. This is his response. Dear sirs, I am. Now, by many standards, G.K. Chesterton was a good person, but in his essay, he called himself the problem of the world. In his essay, he tried to say that the problem of the world begins within the human heart. Now, you might feel confronted when hearing this. The Bible says all human beings are born with sin. It tells mankind inherits sin from the first man, Adam. David said he was sinful at birth, sinful from the time his mother conceived him. The Christian understanding is this. Unless in humility we admit that we are helpless without God and His mercy, we won't have a real solution to the problems of the world. We all need God's mercy and it is our hearts 
the hearts of the individuals that needed to change first for our social structure, community or state to change. Not the other way around. I heard a Korean journalist say this once. He said, in my 20s, my life goal was to change my country. In my 30s, my life goal was to change my wife's temperament. In my 40s, my life goal was to change my children's attitudes. In my 50s, I learned it was me who needed to change. When I heard this, I laughed and I looked into my own heart and I thought about my own relationships with others. I thought about those who I do not like and try to avoid talking with. I came to a conclusion that it is true. I am the problem. I am the problem. You know, crimes, trade wars, embezzlement, family violence, racism, these are the outward signs of the inward twists and knots which we cannot disentangle ourselves. The Christian understanding is human heart must change for the world to change. And only God can change our hearts and destroy the power of sin that rules our hearts. And He will when we turn to Him. This morning, Jonah chapter 3 points to the one who sets our hearts free and breaks the bondage of sin. Look at verse 9. What does the king of Nineveh say? He says, God may relent and with compassion turn from his wrath so that we will not perish. The king of Nineveh was not sure if he and his people would be rescued in his repentance. But we know we will be. How? Jesus Christ is how. As the king of Nineveh rose from his throne and sat down in the dust, Jesus Christ rose from his heavenly throne, emptied himself of the divine glory, and he came down to the earth. As the king of Nineveh covered himself with a sackcloth, Jesus put a towel around his waist and served us. He put a crown of thorns on his head and he died on the cross, bearing all our sins. He paid the wages of our sins in full. He was plunged into the dusty tomb. Yet Jesus Christ rose from the dead in victory to tell us He indeed destroyed the power of sin so that those who believe in Him will be forgiven, redeemed, and receive a new life. God's face turned away from Jesus Christ so that we may have His face. When we put our hope in Jesus Christ, he will set our hearts free and fill our hearts with His love and grace. This morning, we'll finish with a special prayer. It is what's called a prayer of confession. Last week, I realized I needed to pray this prayer. I hope you find this prayer helpful, uplifting, and liberating as I did. So let us pray. Lord, as we think about what's happening out in the world, we look into our own hearts, and our hearts kneel before you. We confess our sins, whether it was a wrong thought, a careless word, a selfish motive, or hurtful action. We confess that we have our backs turned on you through ignorance and pride. We repent of our sins. And Lord, as we look to your cross and your empty tomb, we see you found us in your love. There is no sin that I have committed that cannot be forgiven by you. And there is nothing hidden on my guilty past that cannot be cleansed and healed by your blood. Lord, 
unlock our hearts. Cleanse us of all hidden sins. God in Christ, who sacrificially died for us and gloriously rose from the dead, make your face shine on us. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Church Online, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Now, let me send you with a prayer of blessing. May the love and grace of the Father, whose face shines on us, the righteousness and compassion of the Son, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul, this day and all days. Amen.